A few years ago, I did a full start-to-finish rewatch of Star Trek Voyager, which I considered to be the worst Star Trek series at the time. It has since been surpassed. Is surpass the word I want there? Can you surpass something by being worse? What's an antonym of surpass? Subpass? Did I just make that up? Anyway, since I did this rewatch a few years ago, Voyager has been surpassed at being lousy by other Star Trek shows. Admiral. But at the time, it was at the bottom of my list. After I finished my rewatch, however, I started to question one of my long-held assumptions. I asked myself something I never thought I would ask myself. Is Star Trek Voyager actually a good show? No. <laughs> what? That's not what I asked myself. What I asked myself was, is Neelix actually that bad? Those of you who are too young to have been terminally online Star Trek fans in the mid-90s, and thank God I grew out of that, eh? <laughs> anyway, if that wasn't you, you might not know that when the creators of Star Trek Voyager were developing that show, they were positioning Neelix to be the breakout character. He seemed designed to stand apart from the rest of the cast. He's a native of the Delta Quadrant, the distant section of the galaxy in which Voyager finds itself stranded in the first episode. He's an alien with lizard-like skin and spots and fur growing out of his face. When the Voyager crew first meets him, he's been through some hard times, like, do you have any water level hard times? He's a scavenger. He gets by on what he finds. He's never seen the luxury in which the crew of Voyager lives every day, taking it for granted. He's a fast talker, a bit of a con artist. Not with bad intentions, but he's the sort of guy who will promise more than he can deliver to get the best deal he can today, and who'll worry about the consequences tomorrow. On paper, he seems like exactly the sort of character Voyager needs, an outsider who can bring a different perspective, a little bit of a weasel, a guy who wants to help and often does, but also causes trouble, someone to keep the rest of the crew on their toes and stir things up. Didn't really work out that way, though. Maybe as development of Voyager's first season continued, the creators thought the early version of Neelix, the one we see in the first few episodes, was too much like a cuddlier version of Quark on Deep Space Nine. Maybe Neelix was just a victim of the same sanding down process that rounded off the edges of every other aspect of Voyager. Whatever the reason, Neelix soon lost his disreputable qualities and became a much more lovable and far less interesting figure. Like pretty much everything else on Voyager, whatever potential Neelix shows in the first few episodes is mostly squandered. But is he really that much worse than the rest of the show? Even some Trekkies who are big fans of Voyager in general don't like Neelix, and hey, if someone starts going off about something Voyager related, I'm usually the last one to try and talk them down, but after that last series rewatch I did, I started to wonder if the Neelix haters are being, I don't know, a little unfair. What is it about Neelix that they find so terrible? A lot of it centers on Neelix's relationship with another of Voyager's regulars, Kess. Neelix and Kess are connected to one another from their introduction in the series pilot. Kess is Neelix's girlfriend. When they ask Captain Janeway if they can remain aboard Voyager, they present themselves as a package deal. But there are things about Neelix and Kess as a couple that a lot of people find eh, a little off-putting, let's say. Let's start with the fact that Kess is two years old. I know, I know, she's a member of a species that ages differently than humans do. They only have a nine-year lifespan, so they mature much faster. I'm telling you, man, she's two going on 25. See how that sounds? Not so good. The fact that there is an in-world explanation for why it's okay for Kess to have a live-in boyfriend at two years old, because her species is all grown up at two, is less important than the fact that Kess can be read as a variation on the trope of a precocious young woman who, despite her chronological age, is ready to be an adult with everything that implies. Neelix's relationship with Kess is presented as fairly chaste on screen. They display affection with each other every once in a while, but there's no sexual energy to speak of, which is probably a good thing. And yet, Neelix's dynamic with Kess 
often comes across as more of a mentor or parent than a romantic partner. So he's a guy with a much younger girlfriend, and it seems like he kind of gets off on being the one to teach her and guide her and show her the world. This is mitigated somewhat by Kess herself. She's inexperienced and pure of heart, but she's not a helpless doe in the woods or anything. But it's still gross, and it still reflects badly on Neelix. How many older men who date scandalously young women turn out to be trustworthy and respectable people in real life? I'm guessing, like the average age of their girlfriends, that it's a pretty low number. There's a reason groomer is an insult. From a certain angle, the fact that Neelix and Kess's relationship is so virginal and inoffensive makes the age gap aspect even more annoying. If the show never does anything with it, why even have it? If Kess being two but looking like she's in her early 20s and being Neelix's girlfriend isn't part of the show to be challenging or provocative or transgressive, why is it part of the show at all? I mean, when the 200-year-old vampire guy falls in love with the teenage girl, that's gross too, but at least there's usually a discernible reason for it. It's forbidden love. It's dangerous. It's titillating. Even if it doesn't work or turns out to be more problematic than it's worth, at least you can tell why the author went there and what they were trying to do. With Neelix and Cass on Voyager, there doesn't seem to be a reason. It's as though the creators of the show introduce us to these characters, then lean in and whisper to us, she's two, by the way, just for the hell of it. Even setting aside the age gap-related ickiness, Neelix comes across more than once as kind of a shitty partner to Kess. He's overprotective. He's overbearing. He's jealous. It's as though he listened to a bunch of Phil Collins songs and took them as boyfriend instructions. Big mistake, Neelix. I like Don't Let Him Steal Your Heart Away as much as the next person, but do you really want to be that guy? Neelix is particularly jealous of Tom Paris, who strikes up a friendly and occasionally flirtatious friendship with Kess pretty much right away. And look, I get it. If I was Neelix and my girlfriend started spending time with Tom Paris, a handsome, charming man with, I'm guessing, a hard-on you could do pull-ups on, I'd feel insecure too. If I was Neelix. I can't stress that point enough. But you've still got to let Kess live her life, you know? You can't be telling her who she can and can't talk to on the spaceship where everyone lives. If she's your girlfriend, you should trust her. If you feel like you can't trust her, then she shouldn't be your girlfriend. Trying to keep her away from people you perceive to be romantic rivals is both a losing strategy and an overstepping of boundaries. You need to trust that Kess will respect you and the terms of your relationship just as you expect that same trust and respect from her. And if you're not happy about her getting chatty with Tom, too bad. Get over it. The only exception to that would be if you think Tom might actually do something to hurt her, and Tom Paris would never do something like that. Don't you dare even suggest such a thing, unless, what have you heard? Neelix and Kess's relationship, the underlying nature of it, and their dynamic is a problem, and I can't really defend it other than to say, you know, it's not always noticeable. You can ignore it. And after Kess leaves the show at the start of season four, it's no longer an issue. So that's something. But that's also not the only problematic relationship Neelix has with a fellow member of Voyager's crew. What about his long-running, one-sided bromance with Tuvok? Tuvok greets Neelix in the transporter room the first time Neelix beams aboard Voyager in the pilot episode, and is therefore the first member of the crew whom Neelix interacts with in person from the moment they meet. Neelix is fascinated by Tuvok, and Tuvok is patiently tolerant of Neelix. Despite knowing his name since that first meeting, Neelix refers to Tuvok mostly as Mr. Vulcan throughout their seven-year acquaintance. Once he learns that Tuvok, as a Vulcan, does not openly express his emotions, Neelix makes it his mission to evoke an emotional response from Tuvok. A smile, a laugh, anything. And, apart from the fact that this is hardly ever funny or entertaining or compelling, which, this being a TV series, is the most important thing, but apart from that, it's more than a little messed up that Tuvok basically says to Neelix, I come from a culture where we don't express our emotions, and Neelix says, your culture sucks, I'm gonna fix that, and never moves beyond that. If Tuvok told Neelix that he was a vegetarian and Neelix said, I'm going to get you to eat some meat, and then that became a dominant theme of their relationship, would that be okay? 
Or would pretty much everybody realize that it was disrespectful and crossing a boundary and that Neelix was acting like a dick? You ever know somebody who's one of those evangelical potheads? I mean, not someone who smokes pot and if you're around when they're smoking, they'll offer you some and if you decline, they say no worries and forget about it. I mean someone who makes it their mission in life to convert non-pot smokers into pot smokers. Someone who's like, I'm going to get you to get high with me one of these days, just you watch. And they never let it go. It comes up every time you see them. Like, they have some personal emotional investment in getting you to do the thing that they do. They probably don't think of themselves as an asshole, but an asshole is what they are. And Neelix is like that with Tuvok. Neelix seems to be under the impression that he and Tuvok have kind of an odd couple thing going on, like Neelix is the fun, gregarious one, and Tuvok is the stoic stick in the mud, and together they make a great team. But Tuvok doesn't seem to be under the same impression, and if you think you're in a wacky, mismatched comedy duo with another person, and you're the only one who thinks so, you're not in a mismatched comedy duo, you're just an irritating schmuck. Now, I'm not saying Tuvok hates Neelix, but Neelix's company is far more of an imposition on Tuvok than Tuvok's is on Neelix. Why do I say that? Let's just say there are clues. Like in the second season episode Meld, in which Tuvok performs a mind meld with murderous crew member Suter and finds his usually tight grip on his emotions starting to slip as a result. Concerned about his ability to continue performing his duties, Tuvok tests his ability to maintain control. How does he do this? He goes to the mess hall, where Neelix starts up with his usual shit, pestering Tuvok to try to get him to smile, and Tuvok responds by choking that motherfucker to death. And then he says, computer and program, and we realize it was all a holodeck simulation, but shortly after that, Tuvok erases his own security clearances and confines himself to his quarters for the safety of the crew. He didn't test his emotional control by hanging out with a holographic version of Tom, or Harry, or Chakotay, did he? Tuvok didn't test himself by hanging out with a hologram of Suter, the murderer, the murderer who filled his heart with murder in the first place. He tested himself by hanging out with a hologram of Neelix, programmed to act like Neelix usually acts. Or maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way. Maybe the visit to the holodeck wasn't a test. Maybe Tuvok realized that he was feeling an irresistible urge to murder, and the first thing he wanted to do was squeeze Neelix's throat until his head popped like a goddamn balloon. But since he still retained enough ethical awareness to know that doing that would be wrong and create a whole mess of legal troubles, which who wants to deal with that, he opted to strangle a hologram instead of the genuine Neelix. Either way, it's telling. I bet it felt good, too, don't you think? It must have. Taking another person's life with his bare hands? That's why he locked himself in his cabin. It scared him how good it felt. And that was just a hologram. That was just a hologram he held there by the neck. Imagine if it was a real person. Imagine what it would feel like as the life left that body rising up like steam through a cracked pavement and vanishing into the air, knowing you did that, knowing you wield that power. What must that be like? Part of the problem with the Neelix-Tuvok pairing is rooted in Neelix's status as Voyager's designated comic relief character. That's another reason why I think a lot of fans don't like him. He's the funny one. Those characters almost never work. Comic relief as a general concept isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you're writing a show that's mostly pretty serious, it can be a good idea sometimes to inject some humor into the proceedings, to lighten things up, to allow the audience to release a little bit of tension, maybe let them get comfortable before you double-cross them and smack them upside the head with something really heavy. But getting it right can be a challenge. It's even tougher to pull off when it's almost always centered on one character. The writers of Voyager helped themselves out a little by having Neelix basically appoint himself to the post of comic relief guy on the ship 
So when he functions as the comic relief guy on the show, there's at least some in-universe reason for it. Hey, he's the morale officer. He wants to keep everybody's spirits up. It's me, Neelix, the wacky guy who puts a smile on the face of everyone. Even you, you stolid bastard. I will have your smile if I have to kill myself to get it. That might do the trick. Another point against Neelix for many viewers is how eager to please he is, especially when it comes to Captain Janeway. He comes across as the captain's pet sometimes, which makes him seem pathetic. He's a kiss-ass, and nobody likes a kiss-ass. Nobody other than narcissistic egomaniacs who can't tell the difference between genuine respect and affection and servile groveling because they've never actually experienced the former likes a kiss-ass. Though, when I put it that way, it sounds unfair to Neelix. I think his servile groveling to Janeway comes from a place of genuine respect and affection. If Neelix is anything, he's earnest. Maybe a little too earnest. And I'm a big fan of earnestness. I think it's an underrated and tragically uncommon trait in fiction and in reality. But when you marry the earnestness with the eagerness to please and the constant effort to make everyone around you happy, it can become off-putting. It can make a fictional character seem shallow and one note and forced and just fucking irritating. Yeah. So having said all that, is Neelix actually that bad? I'm not going to argue with the negative characteristics I've been describing. I agree that Neelix is all of those things. His morale officer act is off-putting, his relationship with Kess evokes some really gross and unsettling tropes, his interactions with Tuvok are repetitive and not funny. But is that all? I don't think so. There is another side to Neelix, a more sympathetic side, a more human side, and yes, yes, he's not a human, he's a Talaxi, and you know what I mean, nerd? Shut up! Being able to empathize with others is important, and there are qualities of Neelix that elicit my empathy positive qualities. What struck me during my last rewatch, which I didn't expect, was how strongly those positive qualities come through in contrast to the negative ones. We get our first peek behind Neelix's happy-go-lucky facade late in Voyager's first season, when the ship receives someone who, for Neelix, is a most unwelcome visitor in the episode Jatrell. Neelix is visibly shaken when Voyager is contacted by this guy, Jatrell, who is asking to meet with Neelix. It turns out Jatrell is a Harkonian, and Neelix's people, the Talaxians, were conquered by the Harkonians 15 years ago. It's worse than that, though. Jatrell isn't just any Harkonian. He's the doctor who developed the Metreon Cascade, a devastating weapon that was deployed on a Talaxian lunar colony and killed hundreds of thousands of people, including Neelix's family. Jatrell's purpose in coming to Voyager is more altruistic, however. He's come to test Neelix for Metreon radiation poisoning, which can take a long time to produce symptoms but is always fatal. Though Neelix wasn't there when the weapon was used, he was part of a team that visited the moon in the aftermath to search for survivors and might have been exposed to dangerous amounts of residual radiation. Jatrell insists he isn't trying to redeem himself or clear his conscience. He claims to feel no regret for the deaths caused by his weapon, but the deaths caused by residual radiation weren't something he anticipated, and he hopes by examining Neelix he can find evidence that will lead to a cure. Don't you hate it when your weapon of mass destruction kills more people than you thought it would? God, so annoying. Neelix is reluctant to allow Jatrell to examine him, understandably. Neelix doesn't even want to be on the same ship with Jatrell, let alone in the same room. But eventually he agrees, and the exam brings bad news. Neelix has radiation poisoning. His days are numbered. If Jatrell can't find a cure, Neelix will inevitably start to show symptoms and will eventually die a horrible death. While Jatrell conducts additional scans, Neelix questions him about the weapon, why he created it and how it was used. Why not deploy the weapon against, I don't know, a military target instead of a large population of civilians, Neelix asks. Because, Jatrell says, the whole point of the weapon was to demonstrate its overwhelming, devastating power and force the Talaxians to surrender. And it worked. Neelix asks why Jatrell did it, why he made the weapon, why he didn't try to stop its development knowing the death and destruction it would cause. Jatrell says its development was inevitable. If it wasn't me that created it, it would have been someone else. 
Besides, I've paid for it in my own way. After the cascade was released, my wife couldn't even stand to look at me. She thought I was a monster. She left with our children, and I never saw them again. Neelix says, Oh man, such a sad story really bums me out, but I got that beat. And he proceeds to tell Jatrell about what happened when he returned to the moon with that rescue team in the aftermath of the Cascade. He talks about encountering survivors who were so burned from the blast that their skin was the color of shale. One of them was a child, a little girl who Neelix took home to a hospital. He stayed by her bedside for weeks watching her die. Jatrell tells Neelix, if it makes you feel any better, I think my wife was right about me. I am a monster. I knew I'd become one the first time I saw the Metreon Cascade being tested. I realized what I'd done and what I was. Unfortunately, Jatrell says, he won't be forced to live with his sins much longer. He himself has Metreon radiation poisoning, and he will most likely be dead in the next few days. And yada yada yada, it turns out Neelix isn't really dying, and Jatrell isn't actually looking for a cure, he's looking for a way to bring back all of the people killed by the Metreon Cascade. The victims of the initial blast were essentially vaporized, their molecules scattered in a great cloud that surrounds the moon. Jatrell believes he can reintegrate them by identifying the molecules belonging to specific individuals and using the transporter to reassemble them. After both Jatrell and Neelix plead with her to allow an attempt, Janeway gives Jatrell the okay, and they try to use Voyager's transporter to reassemble a Cascade victim whose molecules are dispersed through the cloud. It doesn't work, and Jatrell, who was hoping for redemption after all, dies shortly after in sickbay. But before Jatrell dies, Neelix forgives him. We learn a lot about Neelix in this episode. About his backstory, yes, but more importantly about who he is, and why he is the way that he is. His story about finding the girl in the aftermath of the bombing is wrenching, the sort of experience that would emotionally scar someone for life. There's another scene in the episode between Neelix and Kess, where Neelix, who at this point still believes he is dying of radiation sickness, tries to deflect Kess's concern by telling her another story of a time he did something heroic during the war with the Harkonians. Kess cuts him off, gently, and says, Stop protecting me. And maybe that's not just what Neelix is doing with Kess in that scene. Maybe that's how we should see the way he behaves with everyone else, too. The clowning, the forced joviality, it's a form of protection. He's trying to encourage his friends to enjoy the good times, to smile and laugh and dance and eat and relish all the pleasures of life because he knows how bad it can get. And he doesn't want the people he loves to dwell on that. He wants them to dwell on the happy bits. It doesn't make Neelix's more grating qualities any more tolerable in the moment, but it does provide his character with some much needed depth. Speaking of needed depth, Neelix goes through a lot in this episode, and I haven't even mentioned all of it yet. He comes face to face with the man who made the bomb that killed his family and hundreds of thousands more of his people. He spends much of the episode believing he's going to die from a disease resulting from that bomb. He relives one of the most traumatic experiences of his life, finding the charred survivors. And eventually, Neelix confesses that his stories of his wartime exploits are made up. He wasn't in the military prior to the attack on the moon. He was a draft dodger who spent the days leading up to the bombing in hiding. His family was killed, and he spent the years since then lying about serving in the war and being a hero and secretly hating himself as a coward. Hey, look, everybody, it's me, Neelix. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. I'm the funny guy. Hey, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. I love that joke. It cuts me deep. There is no blade so sharp as the truth, is there, folks? Yatta da 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 yatta da 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 da. I'm haunted. Knowing that Neelix has lairs, that he's more than just Janeway's court jester and the ship's apparently not so great cook, is a big help. The best Neelix-centered episodes are the ones that poke holes in his cheerful pretense, like Jatrell, or Season 4's Mortal Coil, in which Neelix is injured during an away mission, and awakens in sickbay where he learns that he's been revived thanks to Borg nanoprobes donated by Seven of Nine, and that he was dead for 18 hours. Not unconscious, not comatose, not mostly dead. Dead. 
Neelix is profoundly disturbed, and not just by the being dead bit, either. According to his religious beliefs, when someone dies, they are met by their loved ones who preceded them in death and welcomed into a great forest where they will spend eternity. But when Neelix was dead for those 18 hours, he didn't experience that. He didn't experience anything. No afterlife, no near-death experience. He was just dead. Seeking spiritual guidance, Neelix turns to Chakotay and undertakes a vision quest where he encounters an image of his sister who tells him that his faith is a lie invented by people to soothe their fear of death. Life is pointless, and Neelix's life should have ended when he died the first time. He never should have been revived. After the vision, Neelix decides to end his life, for good this time. He gets his affairs in order, then attempts to beam himself into the nebula that caused his fatal injury the first time. The bridge crew notices what Neelix is trying to do and blocks the transporter signal, and Chakotay runs to the transporter room to try and talk Neelix down. Neelix tells Chakotay about what he saw in the vision, how he was told that there is no afterlife and no point in him continuing his life. Chakotay says, you're upset over what you think your vision means? Dude, this is Voyager. None of this means anything including my life. That's the whole point. Oh, shit, you got me on that one. Chakotay tells Neelix, your vision is open to interpretation. I'm sure what you saw was powerful, but just because people you saw in your vision told you there is no afterlife, that doesn't mean it's true. The vision could have been a product of your fear of death or your uncertainty about your faith as a result of what happened to you. Neelix still isn't convinced. He has no hope, nothing to live for. Chakotay tells him that the crew of Voyager is his family, that he's important. But Neelix says, the Neelix you knew is gone. Just then, Samantha Wildman enters, unaware of what's going on, and tells Neelix that her young daughter, Naomi, can't get to sleep because she thinks there's a monster in the replicator. Monsters in the replicator, Chakotay says to Neelix? Who else but you can handle that? And Neelix relents and leaves the transporter room and helps little Naomi to bed. He doesn't resolve his crisis of faith, but regardless of what he believes or doesn't believe about an afterlife, he realizes that his life isn't pointless, and he does have something to live for. Once enough time has passed for us to forget about him and Kess and accept that he can be trusted around children, Neelix's relationship with Naomi becomes one of the better parts of Voyager in the latter years of the series. He's not a surrogate father to her so much as a friendly, non-threatening adult. The kind of guy to tell her bedtime stories or magically pull a quarter out of her ear or babysit when her mom is working or missing and presumed dead on an away mission, like a fun honorary uncle. It might be tempting to chalk Neelix's ability to relate to Naomi up to him being the same age, emotionally speaking, as she is, but I actually prefer to read the Neelix-Naomi thing as an example of Neelix's empathy. For sure, there is a he-gets-along-with-kids-because-he's-just-a-big-kid-himself quality to Neelix, but maybe the reason for that is that he still remembers what it's like to be a kid. His scenes with Naomi are probably the most natural interactions he has with anyone else on the show. He doesn't have to fake anything to establish a rapport with her. He relates to her innately. Is Neelix able to communicate with children on their level so easily because he holds so tightly to the memories of his siblings who perished in the Metreon Cascade? Maybe. Or maybe that's just how Neelix is, and despite current writing trends, it's a mistake to assume that a given trait is the direct result of a single experience in a character's past. Whatever the reason might be, I think it speaks to Neelix's empathy, to the fact that he genuinely cares about the people in his life, and is able to put himself in their shoes and imagine how they feel and relate to them on that basis. Except for Tuvok, apparently. Ooh, I live by the Vulcan way. Logic, discipline, smile, motherfucker! Neelix isn't the greatest character. I'm not arguing that he is. There are times when he is annoying and not he's supposed to be annoying. That's his role in this episode, annoying. But it doesn't matter what they were going for here. I just want this character off my TV screen, annoying. There are times when his earnestness is clumsily presented and becomes cringe-inducing rather than endearing. 
like his interaction with Q in the episode The Q and the Grey, where Q says, Say, why does Captain Janeway keep you around anyway? And Neelix says, Do you know why Captain Janeway likes me? Because I am loyal, respectful, and most of all, sincere. And those are qualities you wouldn't know anything about. And he walks off in a huff, and Q's just like, <laughs> whatever, man. And I'm watching, thinking, yeah, I'm with Q, that Neelix. What a stooge. Just a corny stooge. There are times like that, for sure, when Neelix doesn't come across very well. But there are also times, more times than he often gets credit for, when Neelix, he's all right. He's never the breakout character of the show, like the creators were hoping for early on, but he's all right. Every once in a while, he's good sometimes really good. You know who else is almost always good? This guy, Ethan Phillips, who plays Neelix and who, like the rest of the cast of Voyager, occasionally gets to do good work with good material, but usually has to do the best he can with material that is mediocre at best. And for seven seasons of Star Trek Voyager, Ethan Phillips tries to make something out of Neelix. It doesn't always work, but when it does, something magical happens, and this grinning, short-necked giraffe becomes a person. Maybe even a person you'd want to hang out with. I said maybe. I've sometimes seen Neelix referred to as the Jar Jar Binks of Star Trek, and while I can definitely see how you get there, they're both designated comic relief characters, they both have the capacity to be <laughs> incredibly irritating, I don't think that's fair. If you crossed paths with Jar Jar in real life, the only humane thing to do for him, and especially for yourself, would be to murder him immediately. Not Neelix, though. Neelix at least deserves a chance. Unless you happen to be Tuvok. That verdict is in, and we have moved on to the penalty phase. And the sentence is... Yeah. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be. But before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Lauren K, thanks Lauren. Matt Harden, thanks Matt. What Would Zappa Say, thanks. What Would Zappa Say. Kyle, thanks Kyle. Brian Rubin, Space Game Junkie, thanks Brian. Probably a real person, thanks, probably a real person. Justin Proctor, thanks Justin. Casey Bennett, thanks Casey. And now for the new channel members. They are Flossman, thanks Flossman. Dr. Lone Pony, thanks Dr. Lone Pony. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, my patrons and channel members who voted in the poll have selected another subject that zeroes in on a specific character, a character from Star Trek The Next Generation, who also popped up more recently in the third season of Star Trek Picard, and even briefly for a couple of scenes in the excellent second season of Star Trek Prodigy. I'm referring to Dr. Beverly Crusher. Next month, The Dancing Doctor finally gets her own Trek Actually video, and that video will be how Dr. Crusher is actually the conscience 
of Star Trek TNG. That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.